for the website. That's good. So we're just going to go, you know, if you guys have used the 2017 beta, this might be a little bit of review for you. If you haven't, you know, it'll be a good kind of starting point as to how to get around the 2017 interface, see what some of the kind of major changes are that would affect your workflow or things you'd have to learn. Then towards the end, we're going to get into talking about uh, other things we're going to be doing with this 2017 release, additional webinars I'm going to be doing, and then kind of open up for a Q&A for people who want to stick around. So probably what the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to get a feel for everyone in here on um, Sorry, I can't find my polls button here. Let's see if you can launch it. Uh, no, have, have you tried the 2017 data? Yeah, got it. Okay, so Ryan launched a poll for me there. Sorry, the screen's not showing up on my go-to webinar here. But I uh, just want to get a feel for if anyone has used the 2017 beta yet. There's a couple names on the attendee list today that I know for sure they've been messing with it, but I'm guessing a vast majority, yeah, it looks about 80% haven't tried it yet. A couple people are curious as to what it is, so we'll let that poll run for a second while I pull up a website here. So for the people that aren't aware, Mastercam, if, if you just Google Mastercam beta, the first link will be this page here. And you don't even need to have your account linked or anything like that. Uh, you, you can download the, the public beta and try it out. You know, uh, we'll be talking about a few things today that have were changes that they made to the 2017 interface as a result of beta user feedback. So we encourage you to try it out. You know, some people use it in the production environment. I always say, you know, with the beta version, you we aren't you know 100% vetted as it's ready for release. We just got the production candidate this week, so it looks like we're getting closer and closer to the actual release, and we haven't seen really any stability issues. So uh, things have been going pretty well with the beta process. So a couple things we're going to cover. I'm going to go over the interface in general, and then I won't read all these items to you, but we're going to kind of go a little farther deeper in, but we're not going to go, you know, too in-depth on specific products like mill, lathe, design. We're probably going to have separate webinars for those in the coming weeks and months here. Mastercam's tentatively shooting for a late June release of this, but don't hold me to it. I don't have that power to decide. If I were a betting man, I would put the over under as the 4th of July weekend. So that's part of uh, the PowerPoint that I'm going to cover when we're going over the mill stuff. But let's just get into the interface a bit. So for you guys that haven't seen it before, this is a completely default 2017 interface minus me making a slightly darker background. I don't like the real light backgrounds. But um, so really the main changes are is that we've gone to a ribbon bar style interface. If you've used any of the Microsoft Office products, it's going to feel pretty familiar. There is what they call, if you click on the file button now, it takes you to what's called the backstage menu. So that's where file open is. It'll have all your recent documents here. If you click on computer, that's where you get to your recent folders. And then if you click on Browse, is where you get your standard, standard file browse menu. This is also where the system configuration is set. If you guys click on that, it actually takes you to similar look and feel. The configuration has changed slightly, some, some of the pages and stuff like that, because of the interface. But a lot of the settings you'll still know and remember from previous versions of Mastercam. And so a lot of people... You know, any of you guys that have been around for a long time, you know, I've, it was actually 10 years for me here at Shopware last week, but it was right around when X first came out when I started. And it was a big jump going from 9 to X. You know, it was a DOS interface. You had all the menus kind of buried on the left-hand side. And, you know, version 9 power users were a little upset with the change in interface. But I think with this transition, 
most of us here and people I've been talking to, the learning curve is much shorter than it was going from 9 to X. You know, all, all the commands are the same. The general layout of the software, everything is going to be kind of in the same location. And it's still fully customizable like how X was. So if you were really kind of focused on just the icons and not using any of the text icon text menus at the top, you can still set it that way. Like I can right click here and say minimize the ribbon. And I can also go in here and say auto hide the toolbar. And I can really get a lot more real estate uh, even compared to the 9 version on where everything is. And if I, you know, hover over any of these menus, they'll they'll pull up. Or if I go to like the solids pane or the planes, and I'll talk about um, some of those changes here in a second. But let me get it back to, oops, I don't want to customize the ribbon. Get it back to how I usually have it. Turn off auto hide there. So some other general things here as far as the interface is concerned. The what you would consider the what we called the ribbon bar in X9 is now moved into this uh, kind of wakeable field up here. So that's where your solid selection is, where your auto cursor settings are, what type of selection mode you're in, uh, verifying selection in in inverting selection. If you move the go to meeting thing here. We talk about these, but on the right-hand side, this is all your your quick masks now, and you can set in the configuration either how how much these dim when you move your mouse off of them. But like the left-hand side is always select all, and then the right-hand side is select only. So, and then also a lot of people, myself included, if you want to do the old um, what what was it called, Ryan, when you did the this menu, the select all menu. Uh, the all or all or only menu in X9. That's that's what it was called. Sorry, I've been using 2017 too much lately. But this is kind of the select all and only where you can specifically pick and want that kind of older style menu. And what Mastercam's goal, while the look and feel is a little different, you know, we tried to retain a lot of the same menus and things like that for certain functions that people are used to using before we kind of completely get rid of them. Where nine was, you know, such a drastic change, it's going to be a little more progressive you know this menu will probably get updated in 2018 but as far as the next year is concerned it's it'll be a slightly slower transition so then one thing I want to talk about that was feedback from the beta users is if, if you look at my blue bottom bar here this did not exist in the earlier beta versions of 2017 so it's kind of quick access to what you guys were familiar with with accessing different planes in your WCS your 2d 3d switch you can set your Z height right here. It's also your wireframe and shaded modes. That's kind of shortcuts down here. And then you, if you notice, kind of your other entity attributes are missing from this bottom menu. They've been moved to the right click menu. So you have your line width, colors of solids, wireframe. You have moved to a different level. You also have your Z height here and 2D, 3D switch. The clear colors, kind of all the standard stuff that was at the bottom there that was there before. And then you also get your standard right click menu, which is still fully customizable. If you guys did customize that fully, and I've seen people where they have a right click menu that has basically every function in the software, that is one thing that will transfer over from X9. And that's your MTB file from X9. So if you move that over to 2017, you will get all those customized menus back. And if you click this button here, you can basically dock the attributes wherever you want. So if you have dual screens, you can move it on another screen. You can put it you know, kind of down in this bottom area, and then it's more similar to an X9 functionality. Personally, I've liked having this in, the, in my right-click menu because then it's wherever I need it to be. And uh, so the last thing as far as kind of general interface here is your Left-hand side, and kind of some bigger changes we made here is, you know, your tool pass menu is still here. Your solids menu is still here. These are all now dockable. So if I pull the solids menu away, I can dock it at the top. I can dock it on the right-hand side. I actually liked uh, Dave Canigliero from Mastercam, who's the mill product manager, had kind of a cool 
set up where he would put his levels and planes on the right-hand side and then have tool paths and solids on this left-hand side. So if I click on here, that docks it further left than all of them. If any of you guys have used the tool manager, it will put it similar to how it was in all of those other ones. And then if I drag it down to these other menus, then it puts it down in these as well. So the other couple big changes in what I would consider the operations manager area is your planes manager is now here, and we kind of rewrote how that looks. You know, X9 added it being able to be modal, so it can be open all the time. So just like I did with the solids menu, you can drag this onto a second screen or put it really wherever you want in the interface. All your commands for planes are up here, you know, equaling out to, you know, front, back, or any custom one you create, you know, creating planes, things like that. The levels manager is now also here as well. Also, one thing that I've been using recently is in the system configuration, you can turn on your level name. Because I would find myself, I'd be drawing geometry and wondering where it is, and I realize my active level is not the one that I have currently displayed. So I always have that turned on now to tell me what level I'm currently active and using. And also, the recent functions has been moved to this tab. So Ken Ehrman, who's the design product manager, when we were doing the master camp a couple weeks ago where it was dealer training on the 2017 interface, he docks this recent functions at the top of his, at the bottom of the ribbon bar here and has the ribbon bar automatically hiding all the time. So he has really quick access to all of his recent functions all the time, basically. So to get a little bit more into that on how the interface customization goes, let me show you guys what I've done as far as I've been using the software a bit more and I've kind of customized the interface a little more to how I like it to be. So if I go to my documents here and go to my 2017 and go to config, I will... And overwrite with my workspace file here. Oops. Gotta close out of 2017 first. It doesn't show my desktop when I'm in the GoToWebinar, so sometimes it gets confusing. I'm going to paste in my custom workspace here from, yeah, that was this morning. I'm going to screw that up. Oh, it has it all in here. So that's one thing I mentioned to QC is that there's not a switchable pull down now for the different workspaces, but basically you can just drag and drop different workspace files into your config folder and have it look any way you want or if you want to share it with other people. And we're actually going to make some of these available that I've been working on once 2017 releases because I noticed that there's some ways where we can kind of make it easier for people as far as what specific products you have and having the interface custom to how you want to work. So a couple things that I've done is I combined the solids tabs, because by default you have solids and then you have a model prep tab. I combined them onto one. I still have plenty of room even for adding more functions to this particular tab. I also combined the transform and drafting tabs into a single tab. And then a couple other ones that I did, and we can talk people through this once it actually comes out. You can build and add the toolpath galleries in here. So now the toolpaths appear in what's called a gallery view where you click a little pull down button here in the corner and you get access to all the tool paths. And then based on, one of you guys install the software, it pops up you know, saying, hey, do you want to join the customer experience program? I recommend you signing up for that. It's completely anonymous. Really all it does is track what buttons you're clicking on and sends it every so often to the development team at Mastercam. So they have the most used functions in the top of the bar here, because if you'll notice, drill is in the top here, but it's also in the hole making section. But this tab, I basically customized anyone that has mill 2D or what we, what we call here 
mill standard as opposed to the mill 3D, which was the old mill one. I basically custom made a tab that has all the 2D functions plus the limited 3D capability that's now in the mill standard product. And I also created a tab here for lathe that combines all the lathe and mill tool paths on a single page. But if I go into the customized ribbon here and I turn this stuff off, so let's turn off my custom ones and get it looking more like how you guys will see it when you first install it. And I say, okay. So this is more kind of a, oops, I have to turn off my solids tab. So this is more looking back how the software looks when, when you install it. So if I pick a machine type here and pick mill, it's going to then bring up the mill tool pass page. And while I was talking about customizing those tabs and making them available to you guys, you know, if you're just a mill 2D user, you don't necessarily want to see these 3D and multi-axis tool paths kind of staring you in the face all day and taking up real estate. And the customization is real easy. We'll probably get into that in one of the um, other webinars coming up because I see it's already 11.20, so I want to kind of get into some of the other items I was going to cover today. One last thing as far as, let me open up that file I had open before as far as interface is concerned. You can access the dynamic planes quickly now right from the XYZ nomen here. If I hover over it, it might be hard to see on the GoToMeeting, but it highlights blue. As soon as I drag it off there, I'm right into the dynamic planes mode. So I could snap this to here and, you know, go ahead and create a custom WCS. And that's just a quick little shortcut that... I thought it was pretty cool. We learned in the training a couple weeks ago. We got all that. So let's go into uh, what we call solid impression. So one of the design changes, and we actually had a customer. I'm not sure if they're on the webinar, but we used this to pull an electrode when I was over there the other day. So if I go to my files here. Solid impression. So I have a file here. Now, if you wanted to get the inverse of this in X9, you know, you'd have to draw some wireframe. You'd have to do a Boolean operation. And personally, I never got that Boolean to work as quickly and easily as I would like it to do. So really, all you have to do is have wireframe to define where you want the, in the, in the impression model to be. So I can snap to here. Now, the only thing you'll notice is I have this file already set up, but I have my Z depth set as, at one inch above the part. So all I need is wireframe to define that particular feature. So I go into the solids tab here, and I click on impression. Now it's going to ask me select chain for impression. I pick the chain. Now it just says select the body to imprint. So I can either pick a face that's as deep as I want the impression to be, or if I pick the whole solid, it'll, it'll basically do an impression as deep as it can go. So if I click on the body there, oops, click on the whole body, say OK. Now you'll see it created a second solid body that's my current solids color, which is dark gray. Now a quick shortcut to display this is Alt-E is picking entities you want to keep on the screen. So I can pick that, say end my selection. And now you guys will see I have a pretty complex, and we've tried this on all different kinds of parts, customer parts other demo parts, it really is fast and easy as far as creating an inverse. Now, you know, it's not going to do like a shrink factor or anything like that. Um, but what I always say with Mastercam, you know, if you're just trying to make an electrode quickly, you can just do negative stock to leave in your finish pass and you're on your way to making the electrode. So that was the solid impression. Uh, next on my list is I'm going to go over a little bit of the mill highlights here, and I will bring back up the PowerPoint. So a couple things we've done, you know, we did make a lot of changes to the interface, but we're also still trying to, you know, improve the actual functionality and capabilities of the software. So one of the first things we did, if any of you guys did a lot of the 2D dynamic stuff and you had a lot of micro lifts, you'd notice that sometimes the micro lifts weren't as efficient as they could be. So we basically rewrote the entire algorithm for that portion of the software to basically make it more efficient as far as how all the retract moves and parts moving around. So this is just a sample of a conference phone mold. And I have it highlighted here on the slide. But in X9, 
that retract move where it comes back and does this other area over here would kind of take a roundabout way to get there. Whereas in 2017, if it sees open space where the tool won't violate any of the geometry or the chaining that you've done, it'll take a straight beeline there. So what we found in testing and Mastercam has in their machining lab, you can even be a little more aggressive as far as what your micro lift feed and speeds are because you can set those separately in dynamic mill. So a couple things we've added. If you guys were using the basic 2D tool paths in X9, there was a new tool path preview function. We've added that for all the dynamic paths. So if I get back into Mastercam here, and close all my browsers out. Let's see, we'll go back to this dynamic mill, what I call the cheater file. Because we'll be getting more into this in the uh, mill webinar in 2017, but we have been doing stuff what Mastercam calls power cutting, where you go from kind of a standard dynamic mill with using some of the new tooling that the tooling manufacturers are developing because of this high-speed tool path technology, where you take, you know, instead of a really small width of cut in addition to a deep depth, depth of cut, you also get a really big, you can do kind of similar step overs to the older style tool pass. But that's a topic for another day. But we've really seen some kind of crazy, you know, they ran 710 surface speed a minute at a 70% step over with like one of the new, uh, I think it's a Plura mill from Sandvik. So if you're in any of these 2D tool paths now, even the dynamic mill, if I were to, it's easier if I have dual screens, but if I go to my cut parameters here and change my step over to say 90%, oops, I can't do that high probably. So 84 is the maximum for that tool. And I hit preview, I don't have to hop out of the tool path. So similar to how it was with the contour and regular pockets from X9, but now you can preview all of them, which on the learning side and also just trying out different settings and things like that, I think it saves a lot of time from hopping in and out of the tool pass. This might run a couple minutes over today, so if anybody has to jet, the recording will be on our website. So. A, Another thing that we've added, because a lot of people have questions on, you know, the dynamic mill is really powerful and you have a lot of options as far as how you chain things, but you weren't really sure what your result was going to be until you generated the tool path. So what we added in is what's called this region chaining preview. And it can be used for teaching. It helps for troubleshooting on our end when you guys send in a file. But let me pull up that file that I have set up for that so you guys can see it in action here region chaining. So I have a 2D high-speed tool path here, and this is highlighting a thing that I think a lot of people don't take advantage of with the 2D high-speed tool paths, and that's making these stock aware without having to draw necessarily additional geometry. So if I go into my geometry here, and let me spin the part back around. So my machining region, I use the new linked edges feature and I chained from the start of this open pocket to the end here. Whereas I think a lot of people would maybe draw some wireframe out here or assign this as an air region and do it. If you chain just the, the maximum extent as far as from the outside of the stock you want the part to go in, this will um, make it easy to be, have the tool path be stock aware. So if I tell it to cut from the outside and then this open chain extension to stock, I want it to take the shortest distance from the edge of the stock, which is making it stock aware. I think by default it's set to none, which is essentially ignoring the stock and then more going off a of wireframe that you're, you're assigning. So I don't have any avoidance error or any of that stuff set. So if I click preview chains here, it's basically giving me now that preview of where the tool is allowed to go. Now, it doesn't necessarily care on how far it's able to go out. You're just basically telling it the way I have it chained is that any of this red and black crosshatch, and you have a setting to adjust the colors here as well. Um, the red and black is actually where material it's going to be engaging. The yellow is where the tool is being contained to. And then the blue is basically where the tool is free to move. 
So if I were to do a different tool path in here and say, let's say we want to pocket this out, but avoid this center island here. I can go into dynamic mill. I can say machining region, pick right off the solid. Let's say I want to pick a loop. I can pick that loop there. It'll give me the preview of it. I can say, okay, now I want to stay inside here. And then also, let's say I want to avoid uh, this space here. I zoom in, pick that space. Say, okay, and I'm leaving stock to leave by default, so I don't necessarily need to care about those radiuses. But really, I'm just showing the, the preview function here. So if I click on the preview, then that quickly tells me, you know, okay, this is the area I'm cutting. I'm avoiding this area. And I, don't I didn't tell it that I wanted to give it any extra room for the tool to move. So without any of that blue area defined, I basically know that I'm, this is chained properly and I'm not going to have the tool wipe through any walls or do anything bad before I ever actually get into the tool path. And I found just being able to do this, I can really start playing around with because there's a lot of power in these avoidance and different regions that you can assign with these tool paths that I think a lot of people didn't really get into with the previous versions of the dynamic mill because it was kind of hard and taking a lot of time to generate those paths. So I just talked about that. Uh, one of the cool features I found on the 3D finish tool pass is we now have a setting for maximum stock engagement on a finish pass. So this is taking advantage of using the stock model feature. And you know, a, a part like this, like the one on the screen here, if I were to do this waterline tool path, and based on my rest rough tool, I'm going to be engaging a lot of stock in these tight corners here, which is bad. So you would either have to assign a finish pass where it wasn't engaging a lot of stock and you know, not necessarily engaging enough on those outer walls where there necessarily wasn't a lot of stock remaining. And it was just basically making your cycle times longer or having to do additional operations. So the file I have for that is maximum stock engagement. And I already have the tool pass written to make this quick. Let it load up here. So I have my first, this is a surface waterline path. And if you'll see here, I don't have the maximum stock engagement defined. So based on my rest rough tool pass before, if I click on the stock model here, you know, I have a lot of material in this channel based on my previous tool path on the OptiRough that I did. So it, it's engaging way too much stock in that rib there. But now if I click to this tool path, you guys can see it's not, can you see that on the preview there, Ryan? As you guys can see that tool staying basically out of that entire channel because it's looking at that stock model. And on your parameters page here, it's on this new stock page. So the rest material page has been renamed to stock and we combined some other things on here. So this function is at the bottom of all of the 3D high-speed tool paths, and it's called maximum stock engagement. And you also tell it which of the stock models to go off of. And it basically will be all the names that you assign to those stock models. And you basically assign it what you want the maximum stock engagement to be for that entire tool path. And one little quick other thing on here, the stock to leave, it's no longer on the cut parameters page. It's on this page. And you'll notice it looks a little lonely on here but there's a new feature coming out. Uh, it might be in one of the 2017 updates, but for sure it'll be in 2018, but we're gonna be having basically variable stock to leave on any solid face or surface that, that you want. And it's a really powerful feature, but it wasn't 100% for the time that we wanted to release this on. And you know, if any of you guys have been around Mastercam a long time, you know, we basically wanna have these releases be 100% stable. And that's why we have the public betas and all that stuff. So uh, we kind of took that out. So, but you still have all the functionality of X9 on uh, stock to leave on drive walls and floors and also on a separate one for check surfaces. But eventually there'll be a window here where you can pick any surface you want and assign any sort of stock to leave. Uh, one other thing just, and I'll get more into these in the mill webinar, um, we've been, updating some of the 3D high-speed tool paths. And basically what we did in the raster motion is there's a new checkbox for this perpendicular fill and it's really easy to use. So if you have a 
raster tool path before, you know, if you had steep walls like this, you'd either have to come back with a separate operation or use a different style tool path to clean up files like, like that. I'm going to switch to my metric config. So a standard raster tool path, you know, it's going to basically ignore those steep areas. Whereas if in my parameters here on the cut parameters page, it's just the perpendicular fill button here. And if I turn it on, you'll see that it basically comes back and does an opposite motion for all those other areas. So I get my standard raster tool path where it's going to go and do it. And then it's going to come back and do that back and forth motion on the rest of those steep areas. Which I know raster is a pretty popular tool path. And I thought that was a good enhancement as, as far as that's concerned. Uh, one quick, quick little blurb on, blurb on this. If any of you guys use the barrel tooling that was introduced in X9, uh, we updated the way that that works. And it will now comp properly to uh, the actual contact location of, of the barrel. Uh, that was some feedback from some customers in X9. You know, you could kind of cheat it with stock to leave, but it wasn't exactly proper. Two other tooling updates we did for 2017 is we now support high feed mills with inserts and the actual cutting location of the inserts. You can import them right from the tool manufacturer website. It'll display properly and verify, and uh, it'll also post properly. And it respects that also the flat section of a high feed mill. And also slot mills, they used to only support the radius on the bottom of the slot mill, but now they support radius on top and the bottom of the slot. So that works really well for un tool paths that are capable of undercutting. Do you have any questions so far, Ryan? I know I'm about five minutes over here. But that was kind of my quick blurbs on the mill stuff. Uh, a couple other things in here were to be, if I were to, let's open up another one of these. Let me go back to. Region chain. Just because this is a good one set up for verify. So we've made a couple changes in verify that people probably notice right away, or I'd encourage you to try out. So a couple things here. You'll notice it, it already started going right when I opened it up. So if you go into your options page here, there's now an option to enable auto start. So this is also really handy on really big 3D files in that it'll start playing the verify as soon as it gets enough information in there to start playing. So you don't have to kind of, before you know, you'd have to wait for that whole bar to fill up with all the tool paths from your job before it would start playing the verify. Whereas now it'll start playing right away. A couple other things in here is you now have the option to record. So and it's basically, it's going to record the audio and it's going to record really anything that's on the screen here. And it's going to save it as a MP4 file. Thanks, Ryan. And you have a couple options here. But it's really nice for sending to other customers or sending to coworkers and things like that. And it works really simple. It just saves an MP4 file to your desktop that you can send or load up to YouTube or whatever you want to do. One other feature here, too, is if, and especially if you're doing like a compare on your Verify tab here, you now have an option to, where's it at, Ryan? Yeah, I didn't practice this one last night. On the View tab, you have an option to what's called Sync Views. So if I rotate the model, and this might be hard to see with my two screens here, or I'm limited to one screen, but if you have dual monitors, you can rotate the, they're now directly linked. So you can now rotate your view in Mastercam as well as in the Verify interface. So we found that handy to be if you're doing the stock compare and you notice maybe a little gouge in a corner, or it's not getting enough material, you can zoom in on the Mastercam toolpath and maybe do like an analyze toolpath and figure out, okay, what operation is doing it as opposed to kind of hopping back and forth. So this kind of a quick sort of troubleshooting step as far as the verify is concerned. But so I've gone over the interface, I went over verify, 
One other quick lathe tip that I'll show you guys. If you guys want to quickly align a tool path or a solid model and lathe, before you know you'd have to use dynamic mill, make sure your planes were all set right, and it generally took a long time, especially if it's you know part of an assembly like this where the parts kind of randomly in space and you need to get it ready for lathe tool pathing and creating a turn profile and all that stuff. So if I go into my machining, it's on the lathe tab, but it's called align solid body here. And if I click align solid body, I can either create a custom WCS or I can transform it to kind of the standard top plane, which is typically what I use for this. So I go to my standard top, say OK. Now it says define the axis of rotation or select a cylindrical face. So all I have to do is select basically any part that's on the OD of the part. Now it's going to quickly give me a, dy a dynamic gnomon here. And let's say I want um, the top of X to be, let's say, the center of my flat. So I can use some of those kind of automatic solid selection tools to assign that. And then if I say OK, it's going to take care of all those transform commands for me. And if I clear my colors here, which is right now, right here now under the right click menu. And now you can see if I go to my top WCS or if I go to isometric, it's now in the proper orientation. And this is now at the top of my X. So it's ready to have this turn profile assigned to it and get to lathe tool passing really quick. But I thought that was kind of a cool feature for the lathe guys. And there are a good handful of other lathe enhancements in here that we'll cover in one of the future webinars. But I know I'm a handful of minutes over now. And we still have most of the other people here. Um, so let's see, let's talk a little bit of housekeeping as far as the 2017 rollouts and some other things regarding the release. So we have some tentative locations. We've been talking with facilities in the area to host rollouts. We're probably going to have one at the TMA again in Schaumburg and do some test cutting there. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the new DMDII facility in Chicago, but Mastercam, actually just this week, we got all kind of the red tape done and paperwork we're a, now a partner of DMDII, which is basically a organization geared around the advancement of manufacturing technologies with assistance from manufacturers. So, you know, there's some tier one manufacturers like GE and Boeing and stuff like that where they're paying, I think, a million dollars a year to be a member. And they have different what they call project calls. But they have a really cool space and a bunch of CNC machine tools for us to hold an event there. We've also been talking with Bradley University. We're hopefully going to do one in central Illinois, which we haven't done one of those and since I've been here. So hopefully we'll be able to hit kind of that southern customer base that doesn't get a lot of personal touch from us with us being located in Chicago. We'll be doing another one in productivity, the Haas dealer out in Iowa. We're looking for some other Iowa locations. So if there are any Iowa attendees on here, we'd be happy to get your feedback. Same goes for people in Wisconsin. We have a pretty good relationship with the HFO Milwaukee, so I think we might do one there. But we're also open for other locations. I know we go to the Cabela's a lot, but after doing the one at TMA last year where we can actually cut apart and do some more real-world Mastercam stuff, I think that goes over a lot better for everybody and becomes a more useful session. And then, like I've been mentioning, we're going to be doing in-depth webinars on 2017 in the coming weeks and months here. I'll be doing one on a really in-depth in on the interface customization, some of the design and modeling tools. We'll be doing a separate one on mill, and then we'll do a separate one on lathe and some of the mill turn stuff for all the turning guys out there. And then in addi addition to that, we're going to have some other 2017 materials available. We've been working with a guy doing training videos for us called VT Pros, which is Video Training Professionals. I think he's actually on the webinar today. But we've gotten really good feedback with those. Almost any new customer I get nowadays, I tell them to get these DVDs as they're yours to keep. They're not rentals like the Mastercam U is. And Mastercam U is being updated for 2017. But another thing, if you guys install the beta or when you install 2017, they have a really long what's new PDF that covers every update in detail. So as you guys can see today, I only covered six or seven of kind of the what's new in addition to the interface changes. But there's a lot of 
enhancements in addition to the interface update here in 2017. Mastercam will also have the website updated for the release, which is what's new dot mastercam dot com, which will have videos in addition to all these new features on there. But um, yeah, BT Pros will be coming out with a 2017 training video right from the beginning as well. But I know I'm about uh, 10, 12 minutes over here from when we actually got started. So we will open it up to if people have any questions, if you have any questions. I know I had to go kind of quick on the interface stuff to get you guys accustomed with it quickly here. But I'm, I got time if anyone wants to hang out and ask other questions on the interface or anything like that. But as always, we appreciate you guys attending. And this webinar will be available on our website afterwards. So if like that Align Solid Body, I know I did pretty quick at the end. If you want to watch it again, just go back to the YouTube channel and skip to that part of the video. And as the questions roll in, when you exit the webinar, it'll pop up. If you don't have time to do it right now, it'll be in the email follow-up that you get. We've been doing kind of a short survey at the end just to get some feedback so we can get better at this. Feedback on our tech support staff to just make sure that we're serving you guys the best we possibly can. And really any other feedback you guys want to give us. And we've gotten some really good feedback. I, I put some in the last email blast addressing some of the concerns people had. People all also have been giving us some praise on doing these webinars more often, which you know, it's a decent amount of work to put them together, but we really do want to make you guys as efficient and profitable with the software as possible and, you know, maintain that number one brand recognition that we have and all the Mastercam fans out there. But I do do, a, I have a random number generator program, so everyone that fills out the survey, one of you will get an email with uh, asking me for your contact information so I can send you a Mastercam U certificate. But I don't see any questions coming in, so I'll probably stop the recording now for everyone on YouTube.